Vintage radio item with little known facts or lore. The Scandia Super 20A. Sold in Sweden, 1940 to 1942. I need to start thinning my 50 plus year collection of old radios. I've had this presumed Swedish radio for 20 plus years and never found any information on it decades ago. It certainly was not in good looking condition. Maybe I should try to sell it at the next big ham fest. Note that the black paper label proclaiming Scandia Super 20A with its almost illegible Swedish text appears to be pasted into a recess on the back panel. But maybe I should make one last try in 2020 to find information on the web. I find that Scandia operated retail department stores throughout Sweden selling a lot of imported white goods, refrigerators, stoves, small appliances, etc., at least even back into the early 1920s. They had even sold a domestically produced radio for a short time in the mid-1920s, but by the end of the 1920s were importing European brands. And by the end of the 1930s, imported radios were a significant segment of their business. There were Scandia outlets in at least eight cities, and in post-war years grew to some 40 outlets. The photo of four Scandia vehicles was taken in Stockholm and is dated 1939. I find that this Scandia branded radio is actually a German designed Lorenz Super 20A that was also sold under the Tefag brand name. But the story becomes more interesting. In 1940, Germany had invaded half of France, and the rest of the country came under an authoritarian, conservative regime headed by Marshal Pétain that had, until 1943, tried to operate with neutrality to the Axis powers, ostensibly to avoid full occupation by Germany. Lorenz factories in Germany were fully engaged in the production of war material, and at least some factories in occupied France were tasked with making broadcast receivers for export to neutral countries to keep those factories in operating condition and earn foreign currency to be able to import raw materials for Germany. Sweden was one of those countries that tried to remain neutral since they only had a small military that would likely be crushed as quickly as had been the case in Norway. The Lorenz Super 20A appears to be their first ACDC all mains receiver. 110 to 240 volt operation was achieved through a combination of fixed resistors and a ballast lamp. There were three broadcast bands, long wave, medium wave, and 13.5 to 52 meter shortwave. There were provisions for a magnetic phonograph pickup and connections for a remote loudspeaker. The antenna circuit features an adjustable wave trap for medium waves and an accessory loading coil can be inserted for better long wave reception. Of immediate interest to American collectors are the seldom seen short metal cased vacuum tubes. This was the first series of Lorenz sets to use the new Telefunken metal tubes introduced in 1938. The red arrow points to the wave trap adjustment and jacks with a heavy jumper wire where an optional loading coil can be inserted. Here we see the construction of these interesting tubes. The horizontal mounting of tube elements were supposed to give the tube excellent high frequency performance capabilities. However, this mounting scheme limited the size of the plate so that it could not be used for audio output tubes or rectifiers for moderate to high tube count receivers. On the far right, 
there is a notation that the welding of the top cap to the base assembly requires about 180,000 amps, but it's just for a second or two. A front side view of the chassis shows only one repair made to this radio. The silver colored horizontal mount electrolytic capacitor is a British made part that is simply tacked across the original brown cylindrical part. I removed it after these pictures were taken. Note the common European practice of using fine steel wire for the dial linkage, where American makers of the day almost universally use some sort of woven fiber cord. The arrows point to the mains dropper resistor wound on a ceramic former and the ballast lamp to regulate the tube filament and dial light current. These radios, while very good performers, required a much higher level of craftsmanship to assemble than American designs of the time. There are tales of resistance in German-occupied areas by workers slowing down production with high-quality workmanship as a way to slow the delivery of items that were being used to generate foreign currency cash flow needed to acquire basic foreign materials for the German war effort. As I began to assemble this PowerPoint, I asked friends in Sweden to try again to find more information, but they found very little to share. One interesting circa 1937-38 advertisement is for this Scandia Tello N10 for long wave and medium wave reception. There are two testimonials and one independent engineering evaluation proclaiming its stellar performance, especially its ability to minimize local interference without sacrificing distant signals. I do not know if this antenna achieved wide adoption in those days. Finally, one of my friends was able to locate this attractive little trade sheet. A loose translation has it proclaiming a four-tube, six-circuit superheterodyne with three bands. Most export radios had a shortwave band. It goes on to say, although Scandia Super 20A belongs to the class of smaller receivers, it is a full-fledged remote area receiver with great sensitivity, good selectivity, and strong tone. The large, easy to understand, illuminated tricolor scale greatly facilitates tuning, especially on short wave. The device has an automatic and manual volume control, feedback, interference filter in the antenna circuit, permanent dynamic speaker with high efficiency, and connection for phonograph pickup and extra speakers. Super 20A is the right receiver for those who want a really good long distance receiver with small dimensions. Here is my little radio back together after a refinish of the cabinet. Some stains remain on the top, but I think they do not detract from the overall appreciation of this radio. The original grill cloth is fragile but complete. The brass plated trim around the speaker opening showed considerable corrosion and staining, and I was actually surprised at how well it cleaned using MAAS cream metal polish. Now that I have found some background on how this radio came to be sold in Sweden, I will be happy to exhibit this radio and keep it in my collection.